Uh, thank you, Joe, uh, and uh, congratulations to you, uh, to, to Nancy Lindberg, to the whole USIP team, uh, uh, and our gratitude, actually, for your efforts to organize this event, considering the circumstances. I know this is a Herculean effort to pull something together along these lines uh, virtually, and uh, thanks for making sure that we're continuing to execute on the plans we have around the Fragility Act. Um, I want to thank you for mobilizing the wide range of perspectives that we're going to hear from today and also on uh, your deep work on understanding the linkages between extremism, conflict, and other peace and security issues. The State Department uh, uh, recognizes your leadership in the, in the task force on extremism in fragile states, as well as uh, insights on the role that women can play in preventing conflict and responding to and also resolving conflicts and crisis. I see my colleague, uh, Acting Administrator John Barsa, has joined us today as well. I know he's going to share some remarks. John, thanks for joining us. And also, I want to uh, briefly mention a, a, a set of leaders from the Department of State who have joined us today as well uh, that it, it, I hope uh, is seen as a demonstration of our strong commitment to the Fragility Act. Uh, here with us today are uh, Assistant Secretary Denise Natali from our uh, Bureau of Conflict Stabilization and op uh, Operations, uh, Director for Foreign Assistance, Jim Richardson, and also our, uh, our ambassador at large for global women's issues, uh, Kelly Curry. And I wanna thank my colleagues all for joining us today. As you can see from the US government participation, uh, we do take quite seriously our commitment uh, to fulfill the mandate of the Global Fragility Act. And we see it as an opportunity to really enha enhance our efforts uh, in fragile states around the world. I saw this personally uh, in my experience when I was going through the confirmation process, uh, uh, newly appointed as Deputy Secretary of State, I had a chance to meet uh, in courtesy visits with a number of, of members of the Senate who uh, had a bearing on that decision to confirm me for this job. And I heard many issues, many issues that, that uh, old chestnuts, areas of disagreement, but, uh, but uh, really, what really struck a, uh, a strong chord with me was in my meetings with uh, Senator Coons and Senator Lindsey Graham, that uh, the, uh, the huge opportunity here for uh, the executive branch and the Congress, uh, for Democrats and Republicans to work closely together on an issue of shared commitment. And I've enthusiastically embraced that here along with my many colleagues who have joined us uh, today in the call. The national security strategy that we published uh, about a year and a half ago lays out the security and prosperity of the United States as standing in part on strengthening the resilience of communities and states where state weakness or failure would magnify threats to the American homeland. That is the logic that sits at the middle of the Fragility Act. It's in our interests. It's not just consistent with our values to work with these states. This includes societies that empower women and recognize them as equal partners in decision making in turn making them less likely to fall into fragility and violent conflict and are also to pave the way towards sustainable peace in areas of conflict. Areas of fragility can also be sources of terrorism, political or regional instability, corruption, crime, intercommunal discrimination and violence, sexual and gender-based violence and mass displacements and refugee flows which strain the resources of countries around the world in normal times and we do not live in normal times. Malign actors are also taking advantage of fragility to exploit resources, to undermine our democratic values, the rule of law, and economic stability. Addressing the global challenge of fragility and conflict calls for a new strategic level approach. Previous efforts to prevent violent conflict and stabilize conflict areas often were hindered by a lack of clearly defined policy goals. Ineffective mechanisms were in place for interagency and international coordination. And also oftentimes these efforts failed because of insufficient host nation commitment. The new global fragility strategy, which the department and the interagency are hard at work uh, developing as a, resp a response to this legislation will help us fill the gaps. The underlying causes of fragility, violence and conflict articulating more effectively how to use US taxpayer dollars fostering greater transparency, accountability, adaptive and locally based approaches and demanding measurable and meaningful outcomes. All topics, which we expect your diverse crowd here today to share their thoughts on as we determine ourselves the best way to proceed. The strategy will build and expand upon ongoing US government initiatives such as the Stabilization Assistance Review, 
the Strategic Prevention Project, the U.S. Strategy on Women, Peace and Security, and the efforts of the Atrocity Early Warning Task Force, all to implement the, uh, uh, which is, serves to implement the Ely Vazal Act. We also plan to leverage lessons learned from the USIP Task Force to strengthen and inform the implementation of our programs. The strategy will rely upon data-driven analysis, something that is uh, quite prominent in our thinking today here at the State Department. And we will do that to assure that we develop targeted programs that can be most effective. At the same time, we want to use those efforts to also increase the contributions from other partners to get them to match our own. We are committed to judiciously using U.S. taxpayer dollars to realize effective outcomes with foreign assistance and to maximize burden sharing. We need everyone helping. The strategy also will require the expertise from key stakeholders outside, like the people who have joined us today uh, for this discussion. Representatives from civil society, grassroots organizations, faith communities, academia, philanthropic institutions, the private sector, and international organizations. So Joe, today we look forward to hearing your ideas, the, the team's ideas, perspectives on how we can best implement the Global Fragility Act the steps that we need to take to be effective in realizing opportunities and dealing with the challenges that lay ahead. So again, as I started, I want to thank you. I want to thank the U.S. Institute for Peace for organizing this discussion and for everyone who's joined us here today. And with that, I'll turn the mic back over to you, Joe. Thank you.